Hey everyone, today's video is going to be branching out from surgery into cardiology, and we're going to focus on a tool to help you evaluate chest pain. So with that, I'll hand it over to our local cardiologist. Thanks. So like you said, our focus today is basically a systematic approach to how I, as a cardiologist, pr approach chest pain. Hopefully this simplifies uh, the general approach and, and makes chest pain a little bit more, uh, less scary and, and uh, easier to diagnose after this video. So my approach to chest pain centers around this tool here, which uh, some of you are young enough, you might not know what it is, but this is an abacus, which is sort of an ancient counting device. But essentially breaking down chest pain, uh, we really want to look at three major things, three major boxes, and that's looking at the patient's history, their risk factors, and objective data. And we'll go into detail what each of those mean. So when we're talking about history, risk factors, and data, what are we really trying to figure out. Whenever someone comes to us with chest pain, obviously there's a number of diagnoses that can cause chest pain. But from a cardiologist standpoint, what I'm trying to figure out is if in a patient who's coming in with chest pain, what is their pretest probability of coronary artery disease? And rather than using some of the more antiquated scoring systems where you get sort of a general percentage of uh, this person's about this percent likely to have coronary disease. I want to give you a more granular approach using sort of these three objective criteria and how to approach chest pain. So first talking about uh, the history of chest pain um, and patient history specifically. Now this can be really important in how you categorize chest pain. We're looking at the diagram on the left side Basically, this is people with higher probability of having chest pain, and that's people who are having not just chest pain, but it can be neck, jaw, arm, back, shoulder, etc. Pressure, a squeezing sensation, gripping, heaviness, again, that increases your pretest probability of, of chest pain being related to coronary disease. Whereas on this side of the diagram here, this significantly decreases your pretest probability. People who are having sharp or pleuritic, meaning worse with inspiration or positional chest pain. And again, so keeping this diagram in mind and a general approach to what sort of chest pain is more likely or what sort of pain syndrome is more likely to be from coronary disease is really important when you're thinking about a patient's history. At the end of a patient's history, you should be classifying their chest pain into one of three categories. One, this chest pain is cardiac. Again, that's that left side of the diagram. Squeezing pain, worse with exertion, improves with rest, improves with nitroglycerin. Possibly cardiac, you know, maybe some of those features, but not quite as clear cut. Or non-cardiac, again, that's sort of following on that right side of the diagram when it's positional, pleuritic, et cetera, doesn't sound like it's coming from the heart or related to coronary disease. So when you're interviewing a patient with chest pain, um, do you kind of just open end ask them to describe it? Or do you have a few questions that you ask every time? Yeah, that's a great question. So the my approach is generally giving them the opportunity first to open end and describe their chest pain. If people are giving me sort of a vague history, what I like to do is focus down my approach. What I mainly want to know is if they're having some symptom that's regularly happening with exertion that improves with rest and the, the exertion I, could, I talk about can be a mental or physical. So it can occur with exercise or something that's incredibly emotionally stressful and improves with rest or if they have nitroglycerin, uh, improving with nitroglycerin. So I usually ask those directed questions in order to help me focus and narrow my differential. So next in talking about the risk factors, 
I'll start out and say, in my mind, the most important sort of highest risk, quote unquote, risk factors are a patient's known history of coronary disease, peripheral arterial disease, or cerebrovascular disease, basically sort of the entire spectrum of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. What are some other risk factors that a patient might have that increases their risk of coronary disease? Well, first of all, I guess this makes sense why the entire vascular service is a high risk patient population because they all have at least one, if not all three of those highest risk risk factors. Um, other things that come to mind, again, I kind of just think of a vascular patient in my head. So hypertension, hyperlipidemia, um, and history of smoking. Uh, those are the biggest ones that come to mind. Yeah, absolutely. And I would add to that, you know, having diabetes, a family history, being obese or having the so-called metabolic syndrome, there's also uh, far more risk factors that are nuanced and beyond the scope of this uh, presentation today. But just keep those kind of main several risk factors in mind, in addition to sort of the core three highest risk risk factors when you're interviewing a patient. And then last but not least is the objective data. And really what I mean by the objective data is what does their ECG look like? And not just what does their ECG look like now, but how does it compare to what it's looked like in the past? And cardiac biomarkers, do you know what biomarker we usually use? Um, so there's troponin primarily, whether or not you have high sensitivity. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and it's really just troponin. The other biomarkers have really fallen out of favor overall in, in diagnosing coronary artery disease, specifically acute coronary syndromes, and high-sensitivity troponin assays are preferred uh, if your institution has them. And then in some cases, you know, if a patient presents to the emergency room with chest pain, uh, we might have limited echocardiogram data, which would be usually done in the form of a focused cardiac ultrasound, either from an emergency room provider or the inpatient provider. And this is really looking for things like if a uh, person's ejection fraction is reduced, um, meaning their uh, pump function of their left ventricle is reduced, and they have regional wall motion abnormalities, essentially meaning that parts of their left ventricle are working not as well as others, which is more likely supportive of coronary artery disease. So now with that in mind, I'd like to outline for you guys my chest pain abacus. So again, thinking through all of the uh, risk factors and categories that we talked about, essentially you'll have these patients in three main categories. So for each of the patient history, the risk factors, and the data points, you will be either dividing them in your head or honestly in, in a lot of patients, especially trickier patients, I'll even draw these out for the patients. So you'll think about in each of these categories. So for patient history, do they fall into the low risk group, the medium or intermediate risk group, or the high risk group? same for risk factors, and same for data. So eventually, at the end of the day, you know, you'll have something that looks like this for a particular patient, and we'll go through specific examples and how you might choose the next uh, best test for patients based on what you identify from their history and data. So briefly, and uh, sort of a full extent of ischemic evaluation is beyond the scope of this video and may be covered in future videos, but briefly your options. Let us know if you're interested in that for sure. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, so briefly reviewing your options for what you can pursue as an ischemic evaluation. Obviously, one option is always to do nothing. And, you know, the other options include your non-imaging stress testing or your exercise treadmill test or ETT or exercise stress test is what you may have heard them called. An imaging stress test, which takes the form of all of those things that you can see there. Uh, coronary CTA has emerged as a tool more recently. 
And then, of course, invasive coronary angiography or cath would be another option. So are these in a order as far as sensitivity or invasiveness? Is there a deliberate ordering of what you have right here? Uh, in, in some senses, yes. So this would be generally from least invasive to most invasive. Like I said, fully discussing sort of the risks and benefits of each test is a little bit beyond the scope of this. But uh, in general, you can think of obviously doing nothing is the least invasive approach. Doing a cath is a procedure, a diagnostic procedure, or sometimes an interventional procedure, the most invasive. You know, coronary CTA, you get an IV and exposure to radiation, et cetera. This, I also sort of lumped it as more like these two are sort of functional testing and these two at the bottom are more anatomic testing. So this is sort of my approach in my mind. And again, any patient that I see with chest pain, I'm thinking about, do I need to pursue one of these tests? And again, using the chest pain abacus and we'll review some clinical scenarios of which test might be best for certain patient presentations. All right, so let's go through the example of a low risk patient on the chest pain abacus. So this is to our uh, local surgeon here. So you've got a 25 year old male. I don't know why you're seeing him particularly, but you're, <laughs> he's an avid Olympic lifter. He's coming in with right-sided chest pain. He tells you it's worse with moving his arm overhead or across his body. The pain gets better with Tylenol and ice. He has no medical history, no significant family history, and he's not a smoker, and he has a normal EKG. So thinking about his history here, when we draw our abacus, where would you put his history in terms of his description of his chest pain? So I would probably probably be seeing this patient either in the post-op setting after their hernia repair, or maybe like a lap coli, something where they have incisions up in the upper right and they're always saying, oh, I have right-sided pain over here. And it's like the high abdomen. And is this the chest or is this not? So this is actually a pretty common situation for me. Um, so as far as history goes, um, young guy, clearly active, um, and no oh way, that's risk factors. So history, um, what he told us is that it's uh, worse with movement and gets better with Tylenol and ice. And so those things sound low risk for chest pain. Yeah, definitely agree. Again, thinking back to our original stratification of chest pain, things that are positional or pleuritic or improve with uh, anything that you think muscle pain might improve with as this guy is an Olympic lifter and may have just had his gallbladder taken out, etc. Uh, again, a pretty low risk history for chest pain. And what about his risk factors? Yes, we don't get a lot of history for him, which I'm going to assume means he doesn't have it. Um, but he's, oh, there it is, no medical history. Uh, and uh, no significant family history either, non-smoker. Yeah, so he has essentially no risk factors for coronary disease. Yeah, exactly. So this would be, again, from a risk factor standpoint, really no risk factors at all. And then what about our limited data that we get on him? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm not even sure in a lot of settings I'd get EKG on this patient, but uh, we did, and our EKG is normal, which is, again, low risk. Yeah, exactly. So this is someone who sort of falls into the stone cold, normal, low risk by history, risk factors, and data. So this is a guy we would do absolutely nothing for. So are you like, do you add like down the column or like what? I don't really know how an abacus works. Like, are we essentially tracing down? I guess we'll see in later examples where we yeah, have more. Exactly. So, so essentially what we're going to do is sort of summate our... Uh, and, and give us sort of an overall low, overall intermediate or overall high risk. So in, in this person who has all three of their uh, data points falling in the low risk category, we would get sort of a summation of an overall low risk patient and an overall sort of stone cold low risk patient, you can proceed with no further testing and provide them reassurance that their chest pain is very likely not to be from the heart.
All right, now let's do sort of the exact opposite end of the spectrum, a patient with high risk chest pain. So this is a patient who is a 72 year old woman. She has a known history of coronary artery disease and she's actually had eight prior stents put in. The last one was done about three years ago. And she also has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, type two diabetes, She's a current smoker, despite being told to stop. She's obese. And she comes in with new, dull, achy, left-sided chest pain. She says this feels pretty similar as the pain as she's had before prior stents were put in. And she, because she has a coronary disease history, she took some of her nitroglycerin tablets that she had at home, and the pain got better with that. She has an EKG uh, on presentation, which shows new T-wave inversions in leads V4 through V6, and that's compared to an EKG from about a year ago. And you're seeing her the, in the emergency room, so you get a high sensitivity troponin value, which is 300 nanograms per liter. And just to give you a sense, normal, if you're, if you're not familiar with it, normal is less than 10 in women and less than 20 in men. So in this patient, starting with the history, where would you classify her description of chest pain? Yeah, so surgeons are not known for being great at elucidating history, but I will say that in a patient that can talk to me, my favorite question is to ask them if this feels like something they've ever had before and what it was then. It usually is a pretty big clue. So the fact that she's having dull left-sided chest pain that she reports is feeling similar to the pain that she's needed stents for in the past sounds high risk. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you brought up a great point there, that one key thing in the history that you should ask, especially in patients who have a bypass surgery or have had stents put in before, is does this pain feel similar to what you've had before your bypass surgery or uh, sort of the corollary is what symptoms were you having prior to your bypass surgery or your stents? That can really clue you into historical details and definitely will substantially increase in your mind the pretest likelihood that their current symptoms are from coronary artery disease. And what do you think about her risk factor profile? So risk factors are just extremely high. Obviously, she has the number one risk factor that you said of having a history of coronary artery disease requiring eight stents, um, and then hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, obesity, and smoking. Yeah, absolutely. So this is sort of that very high risk by has basically every risk factor you can possibly think of uh, for having coronary artery disease. And then what about the data we have in terms of the EKG and troponin? So thankfully the machine told me that the EKG has T wave inversions and that doesn't sound great. And then we have an elevated troponin, both of which uh, are high risk. Yeah, absolutely. So this is someone, again, if we summate down this column here, we're gonna get an overall high risk patient. And what do you think you do with overall stone cold high risk patients. So I'm assuming we, this lady needs to be cath. Yeah. So these people, as opposed to the stone cold low risk people are the people you send straight to invasive coronary angiography uh, or cath. And then where I think uh, the general in general, I think is the harder patient population to think about are the intermediate risk folks. And so we're going to go through three separate intermediate risk patient examples. So our first patient is a 45-year-old gentleman who has a history of diet-controlled hypertension, and he actually has pretty well-controlled blood pressure at home, regularly between uh, around 125 over 75 or so. And he comes in with stabbing mid-sternal chest pain whenever he goes up about four flights of stairs to his apartment. And he, you know, are seeing him in clinic and uh, he has a normal EKG, really doesn't have any family history of coronary disease. He's not a smoker. Um, so starting with this guy, thinking of his history first, where would you put his uh, chest pain history? Yeah, so it's mid-sternal stabbing 
So the mid-sternal parts, I guess a little bit more concerning. Stabbing is a little bit less concerning, maybe moderate. But the fact that it's reproducible with exertion, I'd say maybe like high moderate. Yeah, I think that's a really good place to put it. So definitely having a symptom. So localization-wise in sort of the right place where we think about for coronary disease, um, the stabbing character, not so much for coronary disease, but reproducible with exertion. So yeah, sort of in that medium to high group uh, for history. What about his risk factors? So it looks like as far as we know, he's relatively few risk factors. He's 45, so not that old, um, and some hypertension not requiring medication. So either low or medium. Yeah, so I'd probably put him sort of right down here. So he doesn't have zero risk factors, and he's a little bit, you know, he's not a, an 18-year-old or anything like that, but um, he does have hypertension but doesn't need medications, and his hypertension is not poorly controlled, so has a risk factor, but not really sort of a high-risk risk factor. And then what about his data that we have? So data, we have a normal EKG, so that would be low risk. Yeah, ex absolutely. So we have a low risk data point here. So this is a pretty common patient that a lot of people see in clinic and honestly even sometimes come into the emergency room just because of their concern. And this is a guy who probably falls into overall, again, you're sort of averaging out these three data points here. So he probably falls around average somewhere in the lower end of intermediate overall. So in these types of patients, the best test of choice is probably to do an ETT or an exercise treadmill test or exercise stress test. And like I said, the extent of stress testing is best saved for another video, but um, with a, an exercise stress test, we can get information about if we can reproduce his symptoms on the treadmill, uh, what his functional capacity is, hemodynamic data, et cetera, all of which can be helpful in giving him some further information about his risks and helping us towards a diagnosis. All right, so a second example of an intermediate risk patient is a 55-year-old woman who has a history of hyperlipidemia, type 2 diabetes mellitus. That's, let's say it's relatively well controlled with a hemoglobin A1C of 6.8%. And she does have an early family history of coronary artery disease. She comes in with right-sided burning chest pain that occurs about one and a half miles into her daily two mile walk, pretty much every time she walks. She's pretty worried about the chest pain because of her family history. She does get an EKG done. Again, this is someone you're seeing in the office, and it shows some nonspecific ST segment changes in all of the leads. So in this patient, what do you think about her historical description of her chest pain? Yeah, I think this is the sort of patient where this advocate is going to be really useful because I find myself overwhelmed with all the like subtle, like there's oh, a little bit here, a little bit there. And if I didn't have a systematic approach to look at this patient, I'd probably just throw my hands up and call a cardiologist. Um, so history-wise, right-sided is less concerning, burning's less concerning, but the exertional is a bit more concerning. So I'd say maybe low medium. Yeah, I would agree with that. So she's someone I would probably put somewhere in this category again. The description of her pain, not particularly characteristic of a, a coronary disease causing chest pain. Again, we're looking for more left-sided, substernal, uh, more like dull, aching, heavy squeezing. But the fact that it reproduces every time she exerts herself and at the same point in her exertion is certainly concerning. And what about her risk factors? So a little bit older, 55, um, she's got a family history and hyperlipidemia and reasonably controlled diabetes. I'd say maybe moderate risk. Yeah, totally agreed. She is basically the moderate risk person where nothing is particularly poorly controlled, but she has enough risk factors that it really sort of makes you think about, 
I'm probably going to be needing to do some sort of testing to rule out coronary artery disease because I'm, I have a high enough suspicion for it on my differential. And what about her data? So data, we just had an EKG again, nonspecific ST changes. Uh, I don't know, is that moderate risk? Or? Yeah, I would say it's probably somewhere in the low moderate to moderate risk as well. So a lot of the times with the nonspecific ST changes, we don't know what to do with that. I really threw that in more because the more nonspecific ST segment changes you have, the less interpretable your EKG becomes with um, th doing things like an exercise treadmill test or exercise stress test. So more just thinking about what sort of test we would do next. So in this patient, it really sort of solidly falls almost exactly in the solid intermediate risk category. This is someone who actually, she's pretty young. And when I say pretty young, less than 65 years old, and she brings up the concern that I want to know for sure, is my chest pain because of coronary disease or not? And this is a patient that you can give them a definitive answer without going through an invasive procedure. And this is a person I would consider doing a coronary CTA on, which can sort of definitively answer the question, is obstructive coronary artery disease the cause of her symptoms? And we'll provide her some reassurance, especially because of her family history of coronary disease. So, and you were saying that, that part of the reason you choose that too is because an exercise, like an EKG based stress test is not going to tell us as much because of the nonspecific ST segment changes. Yeah. And that was sort of what I was alluding to with her baseline EKG. So if, if you have baseline EKG abnormalities, your EKG response to exercise becomes less interpretable or less sensitive. Um, the difference between either an EKG stress test, so without imaging, or an EKG plus imaging stress test, is those are both functional tests, meaning they're sort of indirect measures of, of detecting coronary disease. Whereas a coronary CTA, like a cath, is what we call an anatomic uh, approach to diagnosing coronary artery disease, meaning you can directly visualize the anatomy. And then especially in someone who, like I said, might not have the sort of greatest historical descriptors uh, for her chest pain, right-sided, burning, um, but is worried, especially with her family history and has enough risk factors giving her the peace of mind, hopefully, with a normal coronary CTA, I think would be the best test in this patient. And then last but not least, we have a 75-year-old gentleman. Uh, he is coming in with squeezing left-sided chest pain, and this is happening uh, especially when he leads particularly stressful business meetings, which happens about once a month. And uh, this has been going on in general for about a year. He hasn't ever had this pain actually with exercise, and he's a pretty avid exerciser. He generally goes to the gym uh, three to four times a week. He hops on the treadmill for about 20 minutes walking and does some light weights and he does have a history of hyperlipidemia. He's a former smoker. He had a 15-pack year smoking history and quit 10 years ago. He has an EKG done that showed a half a millimeter of ST segment depression in leads 1 and AVL. And he did have a high-sensitivity troponin done, which was 22. Again, the technical upper limit of normal for men is greater than 20. And then he did have a CT scan of his chest a few years ago, just for some other reasons, which did incidentally comment on quote unquote, heavy coronary artery calcifications. So uh, quite a lot of history there to break down. But um, in thinking about this 75 year old gentleman's history, where would you put his um, historical description of chest pain on the abacus? So thinking squeezing is concerning, the squeezing chest pain, um, and the fact that it's associated with some sort of physiologic stressor, in his case, emotional, um, those are concerning. It's reassuring that he doesn't have this pain with exercise, and he has a like a reasonable functional capacity, like he's stressing his heart regularly. So to me, that seems moderate. 
yeah, I would say it's probably somewhere on sort of the higher end of moderate. Definitely reproducible with emotional stressor, but isn't consistently reproducible with a physical stressor. So somewhere on the higher end of moderate is his chest pain description. And what about his risk factors? So risk factors, he's 75. So I think age is the number one risk factor for atherosclerosis. Um, He's a former smoker, 15 pack years, which is another concerning thing, hyperlipidemia. So uh, at least moderate high. Yeah. Totally agreed. I think you hit it exactly right. You know, the older you get, the more likely you are to have coronary disease. And then he has a number of other risk factors that, you know, he doesn't have anything clear cut, no known history of coronary artery disease, no peripheral vascular disease. But we do have the hint that he has coronary artery calcifications, which again, we can talk about more in a future video, but does have some remodeling in his coronary arteries suggestive of plaque. So definitely a moderate to high risk factor type of guy. And what about the data we have? So data, we have an EKG and that CT with the coronary calcifications. Our EKG shows half a millimeter ST depressions, um, which are concerning. It leads one in ABL. So is that another moderate high or is that good to high? Yeah, I put him again as moderate to high. So half a millimeter of ST depressions is... I'm sorry, I'm uh, sort of just pimping the surgeon in you, but that's sort of another nonspecific ST segment change, but you're absolutely right. Uh, Again, what we just talked about, the presence of even a few years ago having coronary artery calcifications on a CT of the chest, that suggests that he does have the presence of some atherosclerotic plaque, some level of remodeling in the coronary arteries. So definitely puts him on the moderate high end. So again, sort of summating his risk factors overall here, this is a guy who pretty clearly falls into the moderate high risk end overall of chest pain. And this is a guy and kind of the other reason I included um, him having heavy coronary artery calcifications was having coronary calcifications makes it much more difficult to do a coronary CTA and read through the calcium. So this is a guy that I would consider doing an imaging stress on. And again, our options for that are things like echo or nuclear or MRI or PET. And again, the modalities we can talk about in a different uh, talk if you guys are interested in hearing about that. But this is a guy who I would at the very least have an imaging stress. And if his symptoms became unstable for any reason, meaning they, you know, started to happen regularly with lower levels of exertion or at rest, I had consider going straight to cath for him. And so those are the examples that I've gone through. Again, hopefully this gives you a generalized approach to how I think about chest pain. And again, when I'm presented with a patient either in the hospital or when I see a patient in clinic, this is sort of the exact systematic approach that I use in my head or even write it down for certain patients and decide how I'm going to work them up from there or provide reassurance if that's appropriate. Well, that is great. Um, Thank you very much. Guys, I know this is a little bit longer video, but treat this as a lecture. I mean, this is a, a big, important topic and you got a lot of great info on it there. I think we'll definitely have to follow it up with uh, talking about the specifics of the types of testing because I feel right now I feel confident and I could go through this abacus for one of my patients and definitely systematically feel like I have a sense of their risk. But I do think I would kind of stutter there as far as what should I do next. And of course, as a surgeon, I'll never really have to do that. But anyone in cardiology or internal medicine is going to be seeing patients as an outpatient and ordering these tests. I think this is a super useful tool and we'll have to get the the second half of it. Um, So again, let us know what you think. Let us know if you want to see the follow up. And uh, we apologize for the snoring bulldog in the background, but she was too cute to kick out of the room. So this video is for education purposes only. Do not use this to diagnose or treat any diseases. Uh, This is not clinical advice. We will see you next time.